Welcome, Caius Reza, all the way from Scotland. We are so excited to talk with you today. For our listeners, tell us a little bit about who you are and what Alba Orbital is. Uh, yeah, so you kind of did a little bit of an introduction there, there but like, uh, my name's Caius, I'm from Glasgow, um, and I'm kind of representing Alba Orbital here. So at Alba Orbital, we're all about trying to democratize access to space in the way that we thought that we could do that is really start by kind of following Moore's law in the same sense that electronics are getting smaller and smaller and try to apply that to um, space technology. So the same way that mobile phones and uh, computers have all got a lot smaller, we're trying to make satellites a lot smaller and bring down the cost to launch. So that's like a little satellites called bug cubes. And yeah, myself, I more handle the marketing and business sides of Alba. Um, and yeah, I kind of got through it genuinely to begin with in the space industry from an internship four years ago. And yes, yeah, still here to this day. <laughs> so it's been a really you fun know journey. You always wanted to do something with space from like when you were little or did you just happen to kind of come across it as you started getting into the university? Uh, so that's the funny thing about university. It kind of puts you on a different trajectory than you might typically expect. I mean, when I saw the internship, I thought, oh, whoa, this is super cool. Um, I'm going to chance it and put a CV in and like I didn't really think it would work out but it really did so I actually started out as like a psychologist to begin with um, I was like training to do psychology but you know in the space industry there's kind of roles for everyone now especially it's becoming you know more accessible more open and you know you need people of all sorts of skills and trades to be able to do that so my job really is marketing and you know business and things like that so I really leverage the kind of people side of it um, mm -hmm. as opposed to like the engineering side so yeah it's help promote the engineers when they're well, too busy you know, building the next things right I, I think you'll agree that you know the aerospace community man it's it's smaller than you would think it's easy to you know once you start knowing people people know each other and you you build a network so I mean, I'm not really surprised somebody with psychology background and good people skills would be in marketing, which really you're about making relationships and finding value for your customers, right? So, oh, yeah, for sure. Like, uh, we say small world, but like you really see it at all these conferences and everything. But like, the mad thing was, like, there's some times that really dawn on you, like, you go, oh my God, it is a small world. Um, was actually, I was in Romania like a week ago. Um, I was visiting, basically, it was a CANSAT competition, but I was also visiting, like, one of the, the teams we work with, the whole high school team who are launching Romania's first ever um, PocCube, the country's second ever satellite. Wow. Um, but besides that point, I was also visiting, like, that team at the CANSAT, and one of the girls came up to me and was like, oh, I, I teach these, like, students in Malaysia. I heard you might be going to Malaysia. And it turns out, like, that was just, like, another PocCube team we were working with that you're already working with <laughs> yeah it was just like oh we know you already and so it's like yeah very, very very small world so you you are sort of the advanced guard you're, you're the leading edge for your class of satellites right these picosats so it makes sense that the community is going to build around you right until you get some competitors i, I as far as i know you're the the name in pocket cubes right now is that a fair statement yeah, that's a really cool thing now because like it was that old thing of trying to push a rock up the hill um, back for a while. So Pocubes have been around for about 10 years now. I think back in December, it will actually be the 10th anniversary of the first ever launch. But yeah, it's been tricky to try and make the standard grow from where it was because you had to beat the perceptions of, oh, it's just a toy or what can you do with this? And it was mainly like a I'd say like a hobbyist community, but ever since those hobbyists proved a way to get to space, um, a lot more of the academics said, okay, cool, we can try and teach our students, we can try and get something from this. They got some data down, which was fantastic. I mean, this MOG project from um, the Budapest uh, Technology, but uh, BME University, they were fantastic. Yeah. Um, little constellation there, um, they measure electrosmog pollution. And from there, you know, again, little companies are like, okay, cool, we can try monetizing this, try to get to space. And now we're at the stage where it's like kind of jumping into bigger companies and people are going for constellations. But yeah, we've been doing this for about 10 years and we are now launching four times a year, which is huge for, for Pocket Cubes. Um, 
back when we were very starting to begin with, um, the PubCube community like didn't have a lot of launches available. So for example, we started in 2012 and I think we chartered our first launch around 2015. And it took six years for that original flight to go out before we started developing our own deployers and pods and stuff like that. So from there, we really thought, okay, what's the next block to entry? You know, we got the cost out, but cost is no good if you can't fly the thing. Um, so we've now been flying four times and work with SpaceX, Rocket Lab, and yeah, quarterly. Well, like, you know, so I remember, I'm not the science person, right? I work with our kids to help them write and to, to present. So yeah. I we were looking at the conference coming up and we're trying to come up with some ideas. And so I was trying to wrap my head around like what a pocket cube is. Like it's a smaller version of a cube satellite. It is one, but it's smaller. So my question was like, when the world could they even test on something? So tell us a little bit about like what the standard kind of payloads are that you would do on something so small. Are they the same that you could do on a, was it 10 by 10 by 10, uh, a one U I guess? And and, and if not, like how, what, what are we testing in pocket cubes? So that's actually a really good question. So um, that's something that people ask quite often. So they are very much CubeSats, you know, little brother. And um, they're about an eighth of the volume um, of a standard 1U if you have to go to like the little 1P sizes. Um, but from there, yeah, um, they bring down the costs. But there's a lot, of, a lot of the missions don't require a whole 10 by 10 satellite. For example, um, the Smog project, which was doing like a little RF spectrum monitoring project which is like monitoring electrosmog uh, pollution from across the globe which can interfere with like uh, device communications but another there's quite a few applications that's becoming more and more popular um internet of things connectivities and um, there's a lot of um, startups trying to make use of you know the small payload space to actually launch to see if they can like connect and like read the data and like well, send some back well, no, I, I actually, I think validating new hardware, like small components, this would be an ideal form factor to give it flight heritage without risking, you know, like a hundred million dollars. So Gabe's battery idea could be on <laughs> yes. something this small? Yeah. So we, we have a student who's interested in a novel battery technology. I might have included his abstract to you. Actually, I, I don't yeah, I read that one. Um, yeah. That's kind of similar to the work Carnegie Mellon were doing, um, but yeah, in orbit demonstrations and orbit verifications of like um, new technologies before they go out to like CubeSats, it's like a really low cost, low risk way of right. That. Um, but again, the small form factor allows for you know more experiments and you know new applications to be made. For example, like uh, an Earth observation is something that we're looking to tackle just now. So in Earth observation, you know you get these really big satellites that are able to take really high images, really resolution imagery, um, but no one's really nailed the near real-time um, market yet, if you want to call it that. So we won uh, some funding from Y Combinator. We did our like uh, seed round, I think 2021. Uh, we won 3.5 million, and that was to build a lot of these little satellites to scale so that we can improve on that um, timing so for example if you go to the example of wildfires um the higher resolution satellites would be you know ideal for like getting a good picture and seeing things in detail um but when it comes to actually tracking things in your real time you're going to need to get sacrifice a bit of um that high resonance to basically come and be able to track it more often so that's where so for, what i'm hearing is temporal resolution right you want to get a picture every 15 minutes of the ground in a spot versus twice a day. So you will, and, and with these, um, would these guys be like three Ps? Because, you know, focal length is the enemy of the CubeSat and the SmallSat world. It's the focal length, right, for your telescope. So are you talking about putting your pocket cubes in like really low ortho, Earth orbits where they have a maybe a shorter lifetime, but you get a bang for the buck or... Uh, does the orbit, is the orbit a critical component to what you're thinking? Uh, and then I got like five other questions, but I'll wait for this answer. So for that particular use case, we're, we're coming to like near real-time imagery. Yes, we're using a uh, three Ps. So we developed a satellite called Unicorn 2. That's the platform that we've been using. Unicorn, the name kind of 
named after a national animal in case you know wonder where the funny name comes from um but yeah again like you said um the resolution is tricky there when it comes to the smaller form factors so right now the best we can do is like 24 meters per pixel on the current platform which mm -hmm. is very good for the nighttime applications that we're trying to tackle again it's like a, a niche in the market that's you know not a lot of people are going after and it's too small to go after in terms of like the bigger company players um but on our next platform we're really aiming for like 10 meters which is good um for something so small Right. How um, th these are a couple of my questions you, as you were sharing. So you you're really a launch integrator. Is that a fair statement? Alba is integrating launches and you're you're the 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 team that takes the customer and matches them with the launch provider. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Um, but it's the thing is, like, we also try to be like a one stop shop. It's probably like the easiest okay. way to say it. Um, so what we do is like um, we do do the launch management. Uh, we've got our own deployer that we've used on four different missions now. We've got our fifth one coming up in two weeks. Um, so we do that. So we integrate them over in Scotland, send them to SpaceX and Rocket Lab, whoever we're working with at the time. But we also provide imagery. We also provide um, the buses for anyone who doesn't want to build their own satellite and just wants to send a payload with us and, you know, ground stations as well. So there's a lot we got going on. We're right. a small team of any folk, but <laughs> you, you nailed it. My last question on this little series is your ground stations, right? So, are um, what type of uh, do you, do you use a, an existing network like Iridium or Glo Global Star, or do you have your own ground stations and amateur radio guys around the world that are collecting data for you? So, in terms of like our own data collection, we tend to use our own ground stations that we manufacture in Scotland. And then we've got a sister company in Germany that happened that uh, manages more of the operations, like actually communicating with it. Um, so yeah, that's the Alba Connect network. It's still a bit small at the moment. It's like two to three ground stations. Um, but we do work, um, we do leverage other people's uh, ground stations infrastructure. Um, there was these Italian guys, what were they called? Um, Leaf Space, I think we, we use them. And we also use a company down in New Zealand as well. But we're looking to expand that as well. So we're looking to put our own Alba Connect um, ground stations in Greenland and perhaps New Zealand coming soon. Uh, yeah. Are, are they, uh, my last question, are they automated or are they, do they have to be staffed um, every moment to make sure you collect the data? Are they automated in any way? Yeah, they're automated. Their early versions were less automated as all processes are kind of are. Um, but yeah, but they are automated. Yeah, oh, you, you got to give us one. Let us put it on top of the school for you. Oh, that would be. Oh, yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. That'd give you a, a Florida location. Yeah. So you need to give you an excuse to come to Florida. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I don't need Benny. Well, <laughs> and I was thinking, so I think when I first met the folks from Alba Orbital, it was at SmallSat a while back. And I don't know if you were there. I don't remember who exactly. Tom Walkinshaw. Okay. So I just remember thinking at that time, we got really excited about pocket cubes. And you and I went down to our school district with the idea of, okay, cube sets are too expensive, but these are more miniaturized. They're more affordable. And the idea, I think, if I'm correct in remembering this, was multiple schools could be able to kind of share or do different payloads. And that's the beauty of one of the things of the being smaller is that you could actually link several kind of tests together and do multiple things. Is that some? Is that really like one of your marketing for points for the, the Pocket Cube? It's not just an individualized thing? Yeah, it's not just an individualized thing as well. And like when it comes to learning, which is like the fantastic, it is a fantastic tool of it. Um, there's kind of like no kid left behind in a way. Um, it's a bit like, you know, cheesy analogy, but it's a bit like a School of Rock or Jack Black, you know, it's not just the obvious rock stars on the stage. Um, you've got the kids who do the, the 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 costumes and the promotion and stuff like that. So in the same way, at the same time, you're teaching these kids um, all sorts and like electrical engineering um, and different disciplines in terms of mechanical computing. Mm -hmm. There's also the really really good teams actually have um, the marketing kids involved. They also have the kids who make sure that you know they learn a lot about about legal, trying to push through the licensing because um, licensing, you know, as cool as 
all the engineering stuff is, you know, you really do need to push the things behind the scenes to make sure. That yeah. yeah. Quick question. In the U.S., we have to go through the FCC for a radio mm -hmm. license. And if you're doing remote sensing, we have to go through NOAA and the Department of Commerce. Over there, uh, where you are in Scotland, are you required from where, from what kind of organization do you get a radio license or remote sensing license? So I believe in Scotland, it might be off, Jim, um, but we typically get our licenses. We usually work with our sister company um, to be able to do that, um, which is, um, we do it via, via Germany. Um, but yeah, um, there's, in the US, there was kind of a misperception about the FCC not licensing pop cubes, which is a bit of a hill we've had to climb. But, you know, now that there's greater momentum behind Pocket Cubes, there's more people launching and there's certainly there's lots of American companies starting to look at it and universities. Um, the flywheel's going and we've been putting out blogs saying like, look, these are all the case studies. See, it sounds like you have fewer obstacles as when it comes to actually launching than maybe the United well, States. No, as as the no, but it's getting easier, right? Oh. So you're saying yeah. the, the world still goes through the FCC or just... American satellites. Do you do you American satellites the definitely. So the only things like technology tends to develop way quicker than a lot of like legal bureaucratic things do. I mean, for example, the UK does have um, difficulty when it comes to like satellite licensing. Um, for instance, like a lot of our legacy companies um, and kind of legacy uh, satellite projects were all kind of designed with lead, uh, geo stuff in mind so it's like the huge right. satellites so they'd have to give you the kind of how to say it's restrictive it's quite restrictive in terms of um trying to get licensing for your pocket cube because the policies are still designed with geosats in mind so what you're saying is you got bureaucracy and probably of it is dates back to the cold war right yeah yeah so like uh, that's that's something that's a bit tricky but um other places move a bit quicker um and you know in america is something you guys have got going really good for you is like you guys take risks and you just send things and try things um so like there's a lot of pocky projects out there now um so one of my favorites is actually based in florida um one of the best pocky projects um that i like is called is by a app vendor called uh, my radar i don't know if you've heard of them um they're based, they're made by Acme. So basically my radar is like a really popular um, weather app that you can get on like the Play Store, Apple Store, wherever. They've, I think they've got up to 10 million downloads, maybe way more than that. Um, but they're basically sent out these pocket cubes so that they can track, uh, they can get more data into their, their weather tracking app. Uh, and they've launched about four satellites now. And the cool thing is like their engineering team is so small. Like most of the operations is made by one guy. Um, his name's Paul Casella, German dude, really cool. Um, I actually met him out in Florida as well. Um, but yeah, they're they're starting to move on to their uh, Horus constellation, which is a hyperspectral orbital motor mm -hmm. system, um, and that's like going to be you know looking at applications like national defense, looking at applications for like disaster monitoring and things like that. So it's really cool. Well, I'm going to pivot just a little bit and talk about your job, someone who's going into psychology, and now you're in marketing in space, right? And we have a lot of students who are interested in psychology in general. So I thought it'd be great if you might be able to share some of the skills that you use every day. Um, they don't have to necessarily be psychology-based, but when you're marketing, what are some skills that a student who might be interested in doing marketing for space needs to know? Well, you really do need to realize, like... Um... Most of my operations, it really does, is really quite people focused and leveraging relationships and all that kind of stuff. So it's like all the little things like um, just going out to see people and, you know, being able to um, communicate things that, you know, the cool things in your company are. So, for example, like um, one thing that I remember reading press releases by the company <laughs> way before I started, like um, it was all very engineering tech focused and it would reach like a such a small crowd. But, you know, if you make it like um, more accessible for people, um, it was a lot easier to read and a lot more people got on board with that. And that's something that a lot of folk can struggle with in the engineering world. You know, it's like kind of like 
scoping out the project right, a bit more. how to sound you know bring it down to people's level but it's oftentimes that i guess the people who are buying or who are interested who ha might have the money behind a project yeah. actually aren't the engineers per se right so yeah there's all sorts of people you need to connect with another and just kind of um it's kind of like intuition in a sense like um, you need to scope out okay cool um what do you think they'll be interested in can i connect them with those people so that's more like on the business side of things um but for me it's really just I'm a big fan of startups. I'm a big fan of like um, being in that environment because learning in university and learning in, in, in a startup was like two very different things. Like you get all your theory and everything in uni, but like um, when you're in a startup, you basically have to wear so many different hats. And like, if you don't learn something, you know, you fail and you try again and you got to do it. <laughs> so I've kind of um, got a really broad... Um, kind of like skill set now which is like um really cool like um everything from like marketing logistics um business sales and even picked up some technical uh, stuff as well um so yeah it's basically just the best thing you could have as like a graduate or a student or anything is just have an open mind and just say okay cool i'll try that and just try something right just take yeah, it's all about coachability it's all about like being able to try something new because you're like, what, I think it was like 20, 21 when I came out of uni, uh, graduated around that time. And yeah, like, uh, I couldn't tell you what a satellite was back then. And uh, funnily enough, like a little known, a little unknown fact about Glasgow is that um, we build more satellites than any other um, European city. And it's mad that so many people on our own doorstep don't know that. So we're just kind of- Right. <laughs> Aren't you the home of Surrey? Surrey is down in England. Uh, but oh. Glasgow is like uh, we've got Clyde Space. We've got. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, Clyde Space. Right. Very well known. Yes, you don't. I apologize for that. That that might have oh, come across. Like uh, a cool little marketing line that we've got is like it just worked out really well. And um, so like uh, Clyde Space, they're actually named after the Clyde River here in Scotland. And basically, I think like the majority of the world's ocean-going ships at one point, maybe a fifth. Um, we're all built in the Clyde and anything that was like right. Clyde built was synonymous with like being really, really well, good quality. That's right. You Historically, you guys are shipbuilders, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, that's very so, cool. Um, my, I'm going to sort of close my end of this out with a couple of questions. One, huh? well, first of all, thank you for coming to Small Sad Education Conference last October <laughs> and Kennedy Space Center. I ate the whole tin of caramels myself, just so that, you know. Uh, and I tried buying them online. I couldn't get them. They were uh, so good. It's uh, it was really more to snack so far next time. <laughs> you oh know, my gosh! Um, you you and the fellow from the uh, Amazonian rainforest were our two farthest visitors that came uh, from the farthest locations. Number one, thank you for that. Number two, will you be going to Small Set this year? Yeah, we've got a booth. Oh, um, fantastic! So, so we're gonna we're going to hang out with you at Small Set. Maybe have dinner one night. I don't know. You got to network and make your deals. While yeah. You're Third, we're gonna be bringing help. the Celts back. <laughs> that yeah, was right. That's what I remember most about that whole thing. Yeah, we, we we really enjoyed the fellowship with your engineers. Yeah. My third and last question is this: Tell us about the Pocket Cube conference in December. Ah, oh, so that's an event I'm like really excited for. Um, so. Last year was fantastic because, you know, we were in COVID. It was so hard to actually see people. <laughs> it was all very online. And I don't know, it's just it's a bit of a magic to how things can just get done when you're around other people. So there's a lot of appetite for like an in-person event, which was fantastic. Um, we actually like maybe double, well, we've certainly over doubled it, maybe over tripled the amount of numbers we had in 2019, which uh, that was my first job. My first job was to organize the conference. In 2019 and that was at Glasgow University Union and yeah we're looking to bring a whole lot of numbers there but basically it's a conference that's all about like um, bringing people from across the world who are all focused on pocket cubes and try to you know help each other build and help each other out with problems because um, back when the first pocket cubes were being built you know there's all these people in different countries um, just focusing on their own builds and stuff and they didn't realize how many issues are just so solvable if you talk to someone else like how do i get a license and what payload do i need like where do i get my payload how do i build this and you know it kills off so many teams at different points and like for example i was talking to a guy yesterday who was like um 
trying to build a 2p mission it was all convoluted with like an adcs and everything for like a very first try whereas he just wanted to get something to space so i was like dude keep it simple you know yeah. uh, you just want to space um and you know get your flight heritage and stuff that'll help your uni a lot um but other than that yeah we we tell each other presentations from oh this is how i got to orbit we had a really good panel on all the guys who successfully got results from orbit and we get exhibitors to show off like their little pod cubes and we get panel sessions and you know we just um we give a little tour of the neighboring like space facilities as well like at alba ourselves glasgow's huge for our satellite production so it's like a nice day out and it's all based in glasgow west end which is like the nicest part of glasgow so some yeah. nice scene as well <laughs> um yeah we'll talk offline about the cost to exhibit and um cool well this is great um I, I, this is great. I could ask a thousand questions. No, he's but still I'm gonna, going to after we're I'm done. I'm going to turn it over. Well, we to always you. end with kind of the same question for our listeners. Of course, a mixture of other educators, some of our students, parents, things like that. But um, there might be students out there, like I said, who are interested. If you had any um, advice for the most part for our listeners or for parents who might have kids who are interested, how, how do, what are their next steps if they wanted to, uh, to, to be successful? I think you've already kind of hit on this. So I like, I, I, yeah, I like I'll just go on that again. I mean, like, um, I really think keeping an open mind and just trying things is like the only and best way to learn. Um, so the age of internet now is like so many things are accessible to you. And if you start to drive your own project, you'll likely be able to, you know, your vibe attracts your tribe. You can maybe start a little group online. You know, that's where we get so many of our builders from. We, we talk on WhatsApp, we talk on Instagram, right. we talk on Twitter. And, you know, you can connect with more people before, ask questions, you know, don't be afraid to look daft. <laughs> well, I think that's what it is, is ultimately kids are kind of insular, right? And while we can connect in any number of ways now, I think a lot of times kids have kind of gotten away from students, even some adults, from being able to do it in person. I think that that's what's important in what you're getting at with the conferencing. And if coming back face to face, that magic is really just about the human connection. And um, it's really important for our kids who did have all that time off with COVID as well. There's a, there's a gap with how well we can communicate or what that means what communication even means oh yeah i mean like we evolved all these years to you know to be with our tribes and everything that's the best way we learn so you know yeah. I mean, <laughs> and now we're all doing everything you know right. from the internet's perspective so we appreciate the fact that you are, are going to be welcoming us out we hope we have an opportunity to come see you out there soon we really appreciate you spending this time with us this afternoon yeah cool thanks for inviting me it's good right. catching up